was a prophet of pure mathematics until his disciples turned inquisitors. A builder of brilliance accused of treason. And in Stalin's Russia, treason meant death. This is not just a story of mathematics, it's a story of power, betrayal and ideology consuming genius. Where ideas were currency and loyalty could be lethal. This is the rise and purge of Nikolai Luzin. And it begins with the unthinkable, a student testifying against his own teacher. Nikolai Luzin was born in the icy frontier of Okutsk, Siberia in 1883, a sickly fragile boy who shrank from the cold world around him and from mathematics most of all. His father, Nikolai Sergeyevich Luzin, was a respected engineer and technologist, a man of discipline and precision who worked for the Russian railways. His mother, Alexandra Vasilyevna, was warm and deeply nurturing, yet overprotective to a fault. She shielded young Nikolai from every discomfort, fostering his timidity and nervous disposition. In their small Siberian home, the clash between cold rationalism and maternal softness mirrored the dual forces that would one day define Luzin's own troubled genius. Numbers, to him, were a torment, equations, an inscrutable torture. In school, he dreaded the subject so deeply that it seemed the future architect of set theory might never even pass algebra. But then, like a flicker of fate, a brilliant mathematics teacher appeared in his final years of gymnasium, transforming Luzin's disdain into obsession. It was no gentle awakening. It was a violent intellectual rebirth. Luzin, once allergic to numbers, suddenly devoured them. He enrolled at Moscow University, where destiny introduced him to Dmitry Igorov, a master analyst, devout mystic, and philosophical idealist. Under Igorov's guidance, Luzin plunged into the paradoxical world of mathematical rigor and spiritual metaphysics, forming convictions that would not only shape a new school of mathematics, but also set him on a collision course with Soviet ideology itself. In the shadows of early 20th century mathematics, where logic and chaos danced on the edge of paradox, Nikolai Luzin carved a new path. He became the father of descriptive set theory, plunging deep into the murky waters of sets, hierarchies and definability. While others feared the wild infinity of the real line, Luzin embraced it, taming the untamable with analytic precision. He studied the structure of sets not just by their elements, but by how they could be constructed, classified and described. The world of projective hierarchies, analytic sets and Borel complexity, today pillars of modern logic and analysis, were born from his vision. This wasn't just mathematics, it was metaphysics dressed in rigour. In 1912, Luzin unveiled a deceptively modest result, what would become known as Luzin's theorem, that changed real analysis forever. He proved that every measurable function is nearly continuous. On any E0 portion of its domain, one could find a closed subset where the function behaved like a perfect, continuous object. It was a profound revelation. That measurable chaos could be approximated by ordered harmony. Around Luzin, something extraordinary took shape, a movement, a brotherhood, a mathematical renaissance. Known as the Moscow School of Mathematics, it was far more than a seminar room filled with chalkboards. It was a battleground of ideas and egos, and Luzin was its spiritual architect. He gathered the brightest minds in Russia, not to lecture, but to provoke, to ignite. It was here that the future titans, Kolmogorov, Alexandrov, Suzlin, were moulded. But brilliance has a price. As the school grew in stature, so did the undercurrents of rivalry, envy, and eventual betrayal.
They were called the Lusitane, not merely students, but disciples orbiting around a singular sun. Under Luzine's demanding yet magnetic mentorship, a generation of minds was forged that would shape the very structure of 20th century mathematics. Among them were names that would become legends, Andrei Kolmogorov, the father of probability theory, Pavel Alexandrov, the giant of topology, and Mikhail Suslin, a prodigy of haunting brilliance. Luzin didn't just teach them mathematics. He baptized them into a world where logic became poetry and sets became living organisms. But brilliance breeds fire, and fires, if untamed, consume. As the Lusitane matured, so did their ambition. What began as reverence curdled slowly into resentment. Luzin, once the unchallenged oracle, now found his authority questioned, his style labelled outdated, his spiritualism mocked by the rising tide of materialist Soviet ideology. Some students whispered that he was clinging to credit, that he favoured mysticism over method. The very minds he had elevated began to pull him down. Of all Luzin's protégés, Mikhail Suslin burned the brightest and vanished the fastest. A towering genius, Suslin uncovered vast new terrains in set theory before his 25th birthday. His work on analytic sets redefined mathematical boundaries, and Luzin saw in him a kindred spirit, perhaps even a successor. But in 1919, amid the chaos of post-revolutionary Russia, Suslin succumbed to typhus, dying in poverty, brilliance silenced by disease. The loss shattered Luzin, not just personally but philosophically. Suslin had been the embodiment of potential, and now he was a ghost. In later years, bitter accusations would suggest Luzin took credit for Suslin's discoveries, a claim that would come back to haunt him during the brutal public inquisition of 1936. It began with a blow that echoed through Soviet academia like a gunshot. On July 3, 1936, Pravda, the official newspaper of the Communist Party, published a scathing editorial titled Enemies Under the Mask of a Soviet Citizen. At its centre was Nikolai Luzin, accused of anti-Soviet behaviour, plagiarism, servility to foreign scientists and sabotaging Soviet mathematics. The article didn't simply criticise his work, it questioned his patriotism, his ethics and his loyalty to the very state that now turned its spotlight on him. In the age of Stalin, such accusations were often a death sentence, not just of careers, but of lives. And so began a purge, not of criminals, but of thinkers. The true tragedy of the Luzin affair was not that the party attacked him, it was that his former students joined in. In front of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, Andrei Kolmogorov, Pavel Alexandrov and others, once nurtured by Luzin, now scientific titans, testified against him. They accused him of suppressing students' work, of publishing only abroad to seek Western validation, and of being ideologically backward. It was a calculated, brutal dismemberment, done with surgical precision by the very minds he had shaped. Whether out of political survival, ideological divergence, or deep-seated resentment, the betrayal of the Lusitane was complete. Luzin was not just denounced by the system, he was sacrificed by his own creation. But in a bizarre turn of fate, it was Stalin himself who stayed the executioner's hand. The investigation dragged on for months, and while Luzin's name was dragged through mud, a death sentence never came. The reasons remain opaque. Perhaps Stalin saw no strategic value in eliminating a mathematician, or perhaps international scientific voices like Emile Borel and others had raised enough concern. In the end, Luzin was not imprisoned, but permanently damaged. His career was decimated, his reputation shredded. The party spared his life, but not his dignity. After the storm of 1936, Luzin was never the same. Though he was neither imprisoned nor exiled, the damage had been inflicted with surgical precision, his voice muted, his presence reduced to a shadow in the very academic circles he once commanded. He continued to work, yes, but in relative obscurity, 
his lectures less frequent, his influence curtailed. Friends avoided him. Students kept their distance. Moscow's mathematical elite, once his disciples, moved on without him, often coldly, sometimes triumphantly. Luzin wandered through the last years of his life with the haunted bearing of a man, betrayed not just by the system, but by those he had loved as family. In 1950, he died quietly, far from the uproar that once surrounded his name. No fanfare, no official honour, just silence. But history, ever the slow judge, began to shift. As the Soviet Union thawed after Stalin's death, scholars revisited the case that had nearly erased Luzin. His mathematical legacy endured through the Luzin theorem, through descriptive set theory, through the very students who had once denounced him, but built their careers on the edifice he helped construct. By the 1980s, Soviet historians and mathematicians began to publicly acknowledge the injustice. Archives were opened, memoirs were published. The Luzin affair became a symbol, not just of political repression, but of the corruption of academic integrity under ideological pressure. Today, Luzin is remembered not merely as a victim or a genius, but as a tragic figure, a man who built a dynasty that devoured its own king.